invite you to open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18 is where we'll be today. If you did not bring a Bible with you, you'll need one. Uh, go ahead and take the Bible that's in front of you in the pew rack. Open it up to the first, uh, first book of the Bible. Genesis chapter 18 is where we'll be. My sermon this morning will make a whole lot more sense to you if you are following along in the Bible. A couple of things I want you to be aware of. When you leave today, you'll see in the lobby there's a table set up. That is our mission table that is describing the trips we're going to take in uh, 2018. So if you have any interest whatsoever taking a trip in 2018, you'll want to stop by and uh, taking a mission trip, I should say. Not just any trip, a mission trip. Uh, stop by and see uh, some of the guys that are standing behind the table, give you some information on our mission trips coming up uh, this year. Also, I think it's probably appropriate that we uh, congratulate uh, Mike Powers. Mike has uh, spent the last week at Southern Seminary, which is the largest seminary in the world, most influential seminary in the world. And there he uh, finished, almost finished all that it was necessary in his doctoral program, he stood uh, and was examined, and I heard from the guys at Southern. They told me that he made straight A's on all his papers. I think Candy probably helped him with that. And he, <laughs> he made a straight A uh, in standing in his defense for his doctoral program, and he now is officially Dr. Mike Powers. Would you congratulate Mike? All right, you might stand back up and get your Bibles. <laughs> Open them up to Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18. Call your attention to the story. We'll pick it back up with Abraham and Sarah. We'll start in verse 1 of 18 and read down to verse 15. It's a long passage, but I want, and it's divided into two parts, verses 1 through 9, and then, uh, then after that it is about Sarah. And we're going to have our attention mostly on Sarah today. Grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Let's begin in verse 1. <clears throat> and the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and he looked and behold, three men were standing in front of him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them, and he bowed himself to the earth. And he said, Lord, or O oh Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought. Wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree, while I bring you a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant." So they said, do as you have said. Abraham went quickly into the tent to Sarah and said, quick, three seas of fine flour, knead it, make some cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and he took a calf tender and good, gave it to a young man and prepared it quickly. Then he took curds and milk and the calf uh, that he had prepared and he set it before them and he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, she is in the tent. And the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, after I am worn out, my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, no, but you did laugh. Let's stop there. 
Father, we thank you for your goodness to us, and we pray that you would use this passage to turn our eyes and our lives to the Lord Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Regardless of how long you live, or where you're from, or even this morning, how confident you might appear, we all sometimes have doubts. We doubt our ability for a task, we doubt our acceptance in the crowd, we doubt maybe our happiness for the future. You doubt if you're pretty enough, or good enough, or smart enough, strong enough. Some of you doubt God's call. There are people in this room right now that are doubting whether or not God really loves you. Maybe you doubt your own salvation. The terrible thing about doubt is that it's, it's paralyzing. If you get stuck in doubt, it's confusing. When you doubt, it's hard to move forward. It's, it's hard to believe that you're loved. It's hard to return love to another. Doubt is a cancer to your soul. It's a, it's a roadblock to your usefulness. And I say all that about doubt because this morning we've come up on Genesis 18, and in the text this morning, we turn our attention back to a man and a woman, a couple that's been chosen by God to receive God's love and grace, and in spite of all the great things that God did for Abraham and Sarah, still they doubt. And I'm guessing on this cold, rainy Sunday morning that you as a man have doubted at some point like Abraham does. Or, or you as a woman have doubted at some point like Sarah does. I think this story, honestly, more than Abraham and Sarah, I think this story speaks to God's kindness to us even when we doubt. Well, let's play a little catch up. We went to chapter 18. Last time we saw Abram and Sarah, it was chapter 15. When we left them in chapter 15, God had spoken to Abram, taken him outside, pointed to the stars, and said, look, if you can count the stars, that's how many children, offspring, you're going to have. Your offspring will be as numerous as the stars. But they both were already pretty old, Abraham and Sarah. And Sarah wasn't pregnant. She never had been pregnant. So in chapter 16, Sarah is tired of waiting. She and Abraham concoct a plan with a servant girl named Hagar. Take her to Abraham. Hagar has a child by Abraham, names that child Ishmael. They think that is the answer. It is a disaster. After that disaster in chapter 16, chapter 17, the Lord appears to Abram again. And the third time, promises a child again promises to establish, establish his covenant with Abram. He changes his name through the covenant of circumcision, makes Abram into Abraham. God speaks to Abraham and tells him, Sarah is going to have a son. Abraham falls on his face laughing. Go back and look at it. Chapter 17. He says to the Lord, I'm a hundred She's 90. Lord, why don't we just take Hagar's son Ishmael and let the covenant be extended through him? Lord, let's do it my way. And God says what he always says. We don't do things your way. We do things my way. And now in chapter 18, the Lord appears again, and this time we see a special kind of kindness. A kind of kindness to his people. Isn't that what the Bible says? That it is the kindness of the Lord that leads us to repentance. It's grace. Grace. In fact, you might say it like this. 
God is gracious to us even in our doubts. For all of you doubting today, I want you to hear that that God's grace is not dependent on your ability to believe it. God's grace stands on its own. God is gracious to us even in our doubts. I want you to see several pictures of God's grace today. I'll just give you two of them. Let's not do several. Let's just do two. Here's the first one, number one. There is grace in interruption. There is grace in interruption, or, or you might say like this, there is grace in inconvenience. This week you're going to be inconvenienced with something. I'm telling you that there is grace in that. Now I know this is going to come back on me. Oftentimes if I'm being impatient, uh, my wife Connie, she might say to me something like, hey babe, you know I heard in a sermon one time to be patient is like, is honor to the Lord. What she's saying is, you preached that the other day, right? So I, I know that saying this, that, uh, that, that there is grace in the interruptions and the inconveniences. Let me show you what I mean when you look at Abraham. See him there in verse 1. Now get the picture. He is a lot like many of us. Get to a certain age as a man. You sit down in a comfortable spot that might be pretty warm. In the middle of the day, your stomach is full. You get comfortable. You doze right off to sleep. I see some of you do it in here. <laughs> I mean, that's what's going on with, with Abraham. Notice him now in the middle of the day. Let me show it to you in verse 1. And the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. That's a good time to take a nap. The morning work is done. The sun is now high in the sky. He goes to his tent, sits close enough to the very front of that tent so that the gentle breeze would come in and put him right to sleep. It is nap time in the Middle East. One thing you don't do is go around and visit people at nap time. And yet... This semi-retired man in a 100-degree day who is 100 years old, sitting in his tent, and his eyes just starting to go down, and he looks out, verse 2. He lifted up his eyes, and he looked. Behold, three men were standing in front of him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them, and he bowed himself to the earth. Now, when we read this, we've got to remember how it's written and what's going on in the story. It is written in such a way, the man Moses wrote the first five books of the Old Testament. So Moses wrote this so that we as the readers, when we read it, we know that this is the Lord appearing to Abraham. But Abraham doesn't know. He thinks it's three men. Later on, he'll find out it's the Lord and two angels. When you see him saying, oh, Lord, that's very similar to him saying, sir. And so at this point in the story, Abraham doesn't know that this is God showing up to him. But there are some things I think we can learn from Abraham when we look at verses 1 down to verse 8. I'm going to move sort of quickly through it because I want to get to Sarah. I want you to see that I want you to see that God works in his time and not our time. God is not running on your schedule. We are running on his. I mean, this honestly, in the text, this is a terribly inconvenient time. This is an unannounced visit by an unknown person. This is a little bit annoying This is you being home on a Saturday morning and the kids are laying around in their pajamas, they're watching cartoons, you hadn't combed your hair, and someone texts and says, I'll be be by in five minutes. Well, you're jerking up kids and throwing stuff and, and, and getting it so it's presentable. This is an inconvenience in life. This is the Lord coming in. This is something that's going to happen to you this week. It's Sunday. Something's going to happen to you Monday. Something's going to happen to me. I know. That is an inconvenience. That is an interruption. That is an annoyance. That it's a traffic jam or a phone call that I got to return or an unexpected change. 
I'm going to invite you this week to remember this. Let it be a reminder that God is in control, that God is in charge, and you are not. And, and he works in his time frame and not ours. I mean, you look at Abraham, notice his attitude in verse 2. He sees these three men. He doesn't know this is the Lord yet. He'll find out about verse 9 or 10, but he doesn't know yet. And he just, I mean, just takes off running. Do you see in verse 2? Hey, it's 100 degrees. He's 100 years old. That's remarkable that he's running. He gets there to him. Keep looking at it. In verse 2, and he bows down to the earth. That means he lays all the way down. He's 100 years old. He's got to get back up at some point. This is remarkable. This is, there is this sense of urgency. There is this sense of humility. Look at verses 3, 4, and 5. He gets there to those men, and he says to them, let me get you some water for your feet and refresh you. Let me bring you a morsel to eat. He runs back to the tent, gets Sarah. Uh, cook, up some, cook up something, Sarah. I'll go and get the, a calf a, that's tender and good. Notice all of this. This hospitality. Verse 6, it's not just he fixes them a meal. He says, I'll bring you a morsel. He brings them three seized gallons of baked goods. I don't know why you'd want milk and curds, but anyway, I guess this is what you eat. It's 100 degrees. I don't, don't bring that to me at 100 degrees. But he's bringing it to us a meal. It's a feast that they could never eat. It's generosity. You know what you have here is humility. It's your attitude. Some of you don't need to become Christian. You're already a Christian, but you need to have a better attitude about it. One of, of serving and humility and hospitality and generosity. A lot of people think that, um, a lot of people think that the writer of Hebrews, I've been looking at this all week. A lot of people think that the writer of Hebrews uh, had this passage in mind when he said in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. When the interruptions come this week, remember, God works in His time, not ours. Let me tell you something else about interruptions and inconveniences. Interruptions, here's the second, uh, if you want to call it a sub-point. Interruptions, they remind us of our condition, our condition. Let me show you what I mean. If you look back in verse 1, go back to verse 1, and in verse 1 we find out that the Lord is going to come visit Abraham. There's a visit going on here, verses 1 and 2, and he comes to visit Abraham at the hottest part of the day. Now think about how that stands in contrast with how God would come and visit Adam and Eve. Remember how he originally visited his people? And when during the day, what part of the day God would show up to Adam and Eve? The Bible says that he would come in the cool part of the day. Now that sin has entered in the world, now that the world has fallen, the fact that, that you and I are inconvenienced, the fact that we are interrupted, the fact that we are frustrated, it reminds us. All of the, all of the nitpicky stuff you're going to face this week and I'm going to face, it reminds us that, that we are sinful, fallen people living in a broken world that needs Jesus Christ, the Redeemer. We need Jesus to make everything right through the cross. So, so think of it like this. Every uh, setback. Uh, if you're a prosperity preacher, you might do something like that. Every setback is a setup for something. I don't know how to even finish that. But I would say to you, let every setback, every frustration, every flat tire. I'm having to do this today. This is a sermon to me in the rain today. Uh, the very worst thing that can happen on a Sunday is Saturday night predict that it's going to be freezing rain between 8 a.m. and noon. <laughs> uh, Any time at that time, and then have it coming down like it is now, that I would not choose for the Lord to send rain on the just and the unjust at church hour on a Sunday. 
I just wouldn't. So I'm, I'm having to preach this to myself that every frustration, every, every, every flat tire, every sleepless night, this week if you travel, every delayed flight, all of these things that happen to us, they are a consistent, they are consistent reminders of our need that we live in a fallen world. We need the cross of Jesus. There is grace. There is grace in interruptions and inconvenience. Now let's put that on the shelf. That's Abraham. Let's turn our attention now to Sarah. Here's the second thing I want you to see, that there is grace in confrontation. Confrontation. Let me set it up for you. We find out around verse 9 Uh, That's when Abraham sort of gets it in around verse 9 that this visitor and this visit, it really isn't about Abraham. This visit is about Sarah. And verse 9 is the first indicator that this is not the average visitor that's come to visit Abraham. Let me read verse 9. Let me show it to you in verse 9. They said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, she is in the tent. Well, when you read verse 9, they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? I got a couple of questions for these visitors. Number one, how do you know I'm married? Number two, how do you know my wife's name? Verse 10, okay, verse 10, it gets even more serious. Abraham in verse 10, he's starting to realize that this is the Lord. He's listening to a conversation, having a conversation with this person. Meanwhile, I'll show it to you in verse 10. Sarah is back in the tent. She hears some commotion going on up there. She sneaks up behind in a tent, behind one of the tent flaps, and she's listening. Maybe she's eavesdropping. And what happens in verse 10 is for her. Let me show it to you, verse 10. The Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now, verse 10, the Lord has revealed himself. How has he revealed himself? Because he alone can faithfully promise life out of barrenness and decay and hopelessness. That's a promise in verse 10. It is a specific promise. Remember back in chapter 15? God promised Abraham, it was a general promise. Chapter 17, God promised Abraham. Now, chapter 18, the promise has ex- it's escalated to an exact time. God is making a promise to Abraham and Sarah that is going to demand faith. But notice what we're told. Notice what we're told in verse 11, and notice how everything is stacked against Sarah. Moses writes it in such a way so that we would understand that uh, this is an impossibility. Let me read it to you, verse 11. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old. Stop there. Okay, just in case you didn't get that, verse 11, that means they were advanced in years. And to provide some more clarity for us, verse 11, the way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. Now here's the trouble with doing expository preaching. Is you run up on a verse like verse 11 that says, hey preacher, now explain this to your church. So how can I explain that the way of women had ceased? Uh, She, uh, Sarah had already Sarah had already had all of the hot flashes. <laughs> she, she already been through all the mood swings. She, she's already messed with the thermostat in such a way that her husband wearing a hoodie around the house and it's freezing cold. And she laying over there like a kerosene heater. She's already been through all of that. The way, that's, look, all this is in the Bible now. This is in the Bible. The way of woman was gone. She'd been through the change. (laughs) Brings us to verse 12. Because she had been through the change, verse 12 tells us that she, look at it, verse 12, that that she laughs. 
I mean, this is what the text says, verse 12. So Sarah laughed to herself. Now, before we start pointing the finger at Sarah, let's not forget back in chapter 17 when Abraham heard that he were gonna have, they were going to have children, Abraham laid on the ground laughing. So why do, we, why do we deal with this with her? Why is she called on the carpet? Later she will be, and we'll get to it. Why is this a big deal about Sarah? Think about who this is now. Get inside her head just a little bit and what's been going on in her life. Maybe... Maybe she laughed to herself skeptically. Maybe it's, um, maybe it's, just, maybe it's just disbelief. You just, I just can't, you just can't see it. I mean, we're oftentimes, we operate like practical atheists. We believe in Jesus. We just don't think he actually is going to do those things for us. And so maybe she struggled with that. Maybe, and maybe simply it's just a defense mechanism. She wouldn't allow, I mean, think about this little girl that, that came into a young woman that was married she grew into a middle-aged woman, always wanting a child, being whispers, hearing whispers of a promise. Maybe she's just afraid. I mean, you get down to verse 15, we know she's afraid. Maybe, maybe the pain of, of, of being so old and waiting so long. Verse 12 says, she laughed to herself. You know what this is a reminder of? Did she laugh to herself? This is a reminder. We don't do things just to ourselves. Remember what the writer of Hebrews said? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. No creature, no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. And in our story, the Lord confronts her. You see it in verse 13? The Lord says in verse 13, now, he's he, he doing this through Abraham, but she's listening. Verse 13. The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? That's verse 13. The Lord conf confronts her. Now, drop down with me to the end of the chapter, I mean, to the end of the passage, verse 15. Verse 15, she denies it. That's what the text says. Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh. Why did she do that? The text says, she was afraid. The Lord says, oh, oh, but you did. You did laugh. She's afraid. She's afraid to believe it. And, and I mean, in the middle of all of this, this is humiliating. Uh, this is a difficult, probably humiliating event. God gives us, in verse 14, one of the greatest most gospel-driven reminders found anywhere in the Bible. In fact, if you get the whole punch of it, let's start back in verse 12. And let me read from verse 12, 13, and 14, and I want you to feel verse 14. Let me read it to you, verse 12. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Part of the purpose of you being faced with an impossibility is so that you can see that God is magnified and remind us that we are not Him. The writer of Hebrews tells us that, you know, Moses didn't finish the story on Sarah. He just sort of leaves it hanging there. The writer of Hebrews picks it up for us and tells us in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 11, by faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. That question in verse 14, that question that says, is there anything too hard for the Lord? That question is spoken on Sarah's behalf. That is there for her. Why? Because Sarah is like some of you. She'd been looking at her circumstances. She knew her own body. 
She knew how old she was, that if nature took its course, she would never have a son. She was looking at her circumstances instead of looking to God. Sarah had to get her eyes off of herself. She had to get her eyes off of her unbelief and get her eyes onto the bigness of God. Now, what about you? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? It's, it's one of the great rhetorical questions of the Bible. Is there anyone that's too lost that Christ can't save them? Is there any sin committed by any person in this building that the blood of Jesus can't cover? Hey, 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 think about what, what we've heard in the national news and probably been experienced by some of you. Is there any abuse too brutal that God can't heal and get you through? Is there, any, is there any adultery too scandalous that God can't forgive and repair and redeem? Is there any life, is there any life too depressed that God in His grace can't gently pull you out of the hole? Is there any hatred too hard that God can't soften and remove? Is there any sadness so deep that He won't dive in to get you and pull you back to life? Is there any marriage that, that's too far gone? Is there, is there any addiction that's too strong? Stronger than God? I, I'm asking you for a personal response. Is there any amount of human suffering that can't be absorbed at the cross of Jesus Christ? The cross is the centerpiece of history. The cross is the dividing line of grace. And the cross of Jesus is the ultimate answer to the question, is there anything too hard for God? The Bible says at the cross, though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be made white as snow. I'm hoping that by God's grace, you've been confronted today with your own doubt. And you this morning will come to Christ. You join me as we pray. Your heads bowed this morning. Now we're going to have an invitation. And I want you to listen to the invitation. I'm going to speak to Christians first. Christians. You have doubted God. Some of you have to the degree that it has really paralyzed you. And so this morning, the invitation is to you as a believer. I'm going to invite you to come forward in a physical act that represents a spiritual reality. And just kneel here and pray and seek the Lord's grace and, and mercy. You may even just want to confess. You can have somebody pray with you. You can pray by yourself. I'll invite you to come. Let's be done with these doubts. Or let's at least start the road out of it. That's for Christians. The second part of the invitation is for those of you that are uncertain. You're just not sure where you are. I want to tell you this. Now look, God has created you for His glory. 
your sin is keeping you from living for that stated purpose, God's glory. Jesus Christ, the story of Jesus is this. He lived perfectly, because you and I can't. He died on the cross in the place of sinners, taking the judgment, God's judgment for sin. God raised him from the dead. So that is an act that has happened. And the way you access that act, the way you appropriate what God has done in Jesus is through one thing. That's believing. I'm asking you to trust him. That, that means you turn away, we call it repentance. You turn away from your old sin, you turn. Trusting the cross of Jesus Christ. God has spoken to your heart this morning. As a believer, you want to come and pray. As someone that is uncertain, you want to be certain. When we sing, I'll invite you to come. Father, thank you for your word that is so good and your grace that is so real. And I pray you would pour that grace out now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do you stand, please, as we sing together?